And we're going to go across and look at the first of our arena shows and our tanks in action with World War One and the interwar tanks. And that's going to be followed straight away by a video from our friends at the Swedish Tank Museum. So we're really privileged here at the Tank Museum because we've got this. This is our Mona Lisa you're looking at. This is Little Willy, what most people recognise as the first tank ever built. Many countries, um, we're not going to deny it, many countries have thought of the idea of something that we think of now as the tank. Um, we're going to see later on in Vienna, um, there was a, a, an Austrian officer, Burstin, who comes up with a design that, that just looks like almost, you know, like a modern tank. And that was before the First World War. Um, Lancelot de Mole in Australia, lots of other people come up with the idea of some form of motorised, armoured vehicle that can cross a battlefield. It's World War I that puts the pressure on, that makes this uh, an item that's really, really needed. And uh, what happens is after the Western Front settles down after an initial war of manoeuvre um, that starts in August of 1914, by Christmas the lines are static, the British, the French, what's left of the Belgian army have to force out that occupying German army. What are we going to do about it? So they start by looking at things like armoured tractors, etc. And in the end, something called the Landships Committee commissioned Fosters of Lincoln to build this vehicle. Um, it's actually put together in six weeks and it was going to have a turret on the top there. This is the second iteration of it with tracks. The Little Willie doesn't actually get active service. It's a test bed, really. This, what we're looking at now, is what the British Army ends up using. It's that classic rhomboid-shaped tank. This particular one is a replica Mark IV. The Mark IV is the one Britain made the most of. Um, the Mark I goes into action in September of 1916. This is the tank, the Mark IV, um, that we build about a thousand of, and uh, over 300 go into action at the Battle of Cambrai. This replica, by the way, you can see Buzz there driving, that's him looking at, <coughs> is controlled by um, everything in there is actually based on a Hyundai Digger engine because what happened is uh, Steven Spielberg's company, they came down to Bovington, they measured up our Mark IV tank, we've got a real one there, and they did this for the War Horse movie, built the replica, and at the end of the filming we were able to acquire the replica. So we can drive this thing around. And we'll talk a little bit later about the issues about driving real tanks around all the time and some of the problems. We have retired our two First World War tanks that were runners. Uh, we did that before the First World War anniversaries, very much in mind with thinking about preservation. We just needed to, um, to look after those vehicles that were getting a bit broken around the edges. And so with this wonderful replica, we can do this, which is um, film it, show it like this to people and give you that impression, look at that view there, of what a tank might have been like coming forward to a German infantryman in a tank, uh, in a trench, sort of waiting for it. Now the Germans, their uh, initial response to the tank, they weren't too worried about it. That very first tank attack wasn't that successful. Um, but they um, started a programme that led to this, the A7V, 18-man uh, crew. By the end of the war, they'd only actually built 20 of these whopping great, look like it's a house on tracks there, doesn't it? Um, it ended up with a gun, uh, a howitzer in the front, machine guns dotted around the side. Um, 20 of them built, not that effective. The French were looking at the idea pretty much the same time as the British, because again, French got the same problem. How are we going to push out that occupying German army? So with this tank, this is a Saint-Chamond. Uh, the first French tank is a tank called the Schneider, um, relatively small, but still the same problem as this one, the Saint-Chamond. They use the Holt tractor as its suspension and track system. And you can see they try to extend it, but it's not that long. And so both this tank, the Saint-Chamond, and its predecessor, the Schneider, have big overhangs either end. And you can imagine on a pretty rough battlefield, that's not going to do you any good. Eight-man crew, 75 mm the classic French artillery piece stuck in the front there. And uh, they do see action, but they are not that successful. They are getting bogged down, getting trapped in mud. Um, any sort of bank, this thing tends to get stuck. The amazing thing about it, though, is inside there is petrol electric drive. Uh, right back in the First World War, you've got uh, petrol electric. So uh, an engine that's actually powering little electric motors. Now this is our, it's technically not a First World War vehicle, this is our 1920 pattern Rolls-Royce, but it looks pretty much as they did in the First World War. Um, the Rolls-Royce, obviously that amazing, the Silver Ghost, 
amazing car, very reliable, beautifully built, armour plate on the top of it and it tends to go on forever. And this particular one was built in Derby in 1920. It saw action around the world. It was in Shanghai in the late 1920s. This was still patrolling the coastline of Norfolk uh, in the beginning of the Second World War. And under there, you can just about see glinting there, that radiator. That's your classic Rolls-Royce Silver Ghost radiator. Red letters, not black. They changed them black after uh, uh, Rolls died. Um, but uh, there you've got a vehicle that was that one end of a spectrum, why not buy the best vehicle going, put armour plate on it and it keeps going forever. And uh, it's a pleasure, this is another one of these vehicles, anyone who drives it will tell you what a wonderful vehicle it is to drive. And uh, all the old jokes about, you know, is it running sir and everything, because the engine is so quiet, so silent. They double up the wheels at the back, that's about the only real difference there, and strengthen the springs um, for just over a three tonne armoured vehicle. Um, so you're looking there at a vehicle that, a uh, bit of a rarity, and another rarity here, this was where we had the opportunity of driving our Vickers medium tank. Um, after the First World War, Britain does retain tanks. Um, it has about five battalions of those rhomboid Mark V's. It's just started to get the medium D in. Um, but Vickers becomes the only real tank design workshop in the UK. And they asked for a call for the military in about 1923. They want a vehicle, and here we've got one that becomes a, a vehicle that Britain really trains with. A couple of hundred made. It really trains with them and experiments with them in the 20s and 30s. And at the time, this is a complete world beater. Three pounder gun, so a high velocity gun, so that could take on other tanks if it ever met them. And really importantly, a three man turret. And the next tank that comes along that goes into production with a three-man turret is uh, the Panzer III. Why is it so important? It's because it means a commander can command. You've got a gunner who's actually laying or aiming the gun. And on the other side, you've got a loader. Down the front, you've actually got a driver in his own little sort of box. You can see him there with his head out at the front, engine next to him. And you can actually duplicate. You can have other guys firing the machine guns, three Vickers machine guns set around the side. So a tank that... Uh, Whenever it appears, it always looks you know, rather dated and everything, but when it comes into service, cutting edge, and the tank corps using this vehicle up on Salisbury Plain at the end of the 1920s with other armoured vehicles, like little scout vehicles, troops in trucks, etc., something called the mechanised force, experimenting with the idea, what can we do with a mechanised force against traditional forces? So cavalry on horseback, marching infantry, and the British High Command, they fall for the idea, they think it's a great idea. What happens is a 1930 depression, no one, especially Britain, has any money uh, to be able to do much with that um, into the 1930s. There's, uh, we also have something called the 10-year rule. We're not going to go to war for 10 years. So uh, it's only really from about 1934 that rearmament in Britain begins. And the money tends to go for aeroplanes, uh, for defence, and the Navy. Tanks are low down the list, but we start building tanks again um, from about early the 1930s. But this is a, a real rarity to see this driving around, classic British vehicle of that period, um, and something that again, really, you know, you'll, I doubt very much it will get out again because it's now back inside the museum. So as a runner, um, this was one of those moments where of uh, seeing, there's only another one of these left in uh, South Africa, I believe, and a bit of a rusty one over in Fort Benning in America. So quite something to see there. They also were very adaptable. They took the turrets off and made one a command post. They did another sort of version for towing artillery as well. So uh, another one of these vehicles that uh, early days in production runs where people are realizing a costly vehicle, let's try and multitask it. Let's get all we possibly can from it. Now here we've got uh, another strand of vehicles that was being built in the 20s and 30s. Vickers also invested in light tanks and the army were buying these. This is a Mark IV, probably our earliest running track vehicle at the moment. Um, this was really kindly uh, sat in the sheds looking a bit forlorn for itself. Uh, a chap came along and offered us the money for restoring it. So we restored this one. Um, two man crews, last of the light tanks. But uh, Vickers ended up, they came up with a light 6B. These were the tanks that Britain was starting to build before the Second World War to also give factories some form of, uh, uh, of knowledge base, of experience in building tanks before World War II came along. So there's some of the British tanks we're going around. We're now going to go to Sweden and look at one of their vehicles. 
Welcome to Sweden and the Swedish Tank Museum, Arsenalen. We are located one hour drive west of Stockholm and we are open all year. In the museum you can have a look at the development of uh, tanks and uh, military vehicles from First World War till present day. And we don't only have uh, Swedish vehicles, we also have a lot of foreign vehicles to show the impact on history and why we developed a tank industry in Sweden. We have a few very unique vehicles that's only possible to see here in Sweden, the only examples in the world. So uh, it's an interesting collection from many aspects. You can follow us on uh, social media, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and of course our homepage. Today we are going to show you a tank that's only possible to see live here in Sweden. 100 years old uh, German tank from the First World War. The German LK2 made in 1918 and used in Sweden from 1922 to 1930. And we will present it to you in a few seconds. What we're looking at now is quite an amazing vehicle. This is um, a, a vehicle that the Swedes call an LK2, but what it really is, is a German tank of the First World War. Now we saw earlier that mock-up A7V, uh, which was, A7V is the actual sort of abbreviation of the design bureau or the, the office in the German military that was looking after motorization. And this is a vehicle that Hans Vollmer, who designs the A7V, comes up with it looks a bit like the British Whippet tank. So you've got the engine in the front, this barbette as it were at the back. You can see there the driver looking out of it and a little turret with a machine gun on. Um, what happens is two prototypes are made by July of 1918, but they don't see action, they don't go into production. But Sweden secretly, after the First World War, it negotiates with the Germans and they buy in essence what becomes about the kit for 20 of these LK2 tanks and they're taken over to Sweden. Five of them are later upgraded, and that's what we're looking up here, is one of the upgraded ones. They put a new Scania engine in, the original Benz engine wasn't really powerful enough. And uh, uh, amazingly, quite a number of these ended up surviving of the 10. One was gifted back to the German, the Panzer Museum in Munster. Um, there's one of the five earlier models is on display inside the museum. And this is one of the models um, that they got going again with a tremendous restoration project. Started back, I think it was about 2018. Um, they got help from industry, volunteers, all sorts of people there. And uh, when you think what they're trying to do there, putting together a vehicle of that age um, that dates back from the 1920s, is really, really quite something. So you're looking at a piece of German First World War tank design as adapted and used by the Swedes. And these tanks, Sweden ends up becoming a tank producing nation. That's the other thing, um, which is quite interesting seeing which countries take up tanks, um, sometimes buying in tanks from abroad, as Sweden did here then, but then they build their own factories and their own defensive industries. And Sweden's one of the few countries left in the world at the moment that still act basically with Haglunds can still put together a fairly sizable armored vehicle. So this LK2, I think, Richard, you've actually been out there and you've seen this one driving around, haven't you? Fantastic restoration. And I have to say, Stefan has done, they, his team there, considering all volunteers as well, have done an incredible job on there. Something like 5,000 man hours to get this ready in a four and a half year restoration process. So a truly incredible vehicle uh, and well worth doing. So um, if you've not been, I mean, I've been out there as well. This is um, their, their museum there is quite a stunning museum because the range of vehicles they've actually got in place is quite something as uh, Stefan was showing us sort of thing and they do again an event similar to our tank fest and I know you guys have also put in place there another one of your games areas haven't you? Yes we have yeah we've got a gaming area there as well and uh, I can't believe Stefan didn't showcase uh, an S tank. <laughs> Yeah, that would be one of those ones. We have an S tank here but I think it costs the amount of money to keep one of those going isn't it? What was their, uh, their engines? Museum Arsenalen. And if you want to come and visit us, please do. Uh, and in the meantime, you can follow us on social media Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and of course, the homepage. Hope to see you soon again. Bye bye.
So we were saying earlier, weren't we, it looked like some Stefan needs a good little tickle around the ribs sometimes, but he's actually a lovely guy, very friendly. If you do go over there and that, um, he does smile and break into a smile. And another one that if you look on their website, they do some cracking films as well. So uh, Stefan's done a lovely little video on how you uh, eat your food in a tank and some of the history behind that. And a well. beautiful, you know, real friendly family or oriented museum as yeah, well. Yeah, really so worth really, it really nice. if you have your chance to go to Sweden. So David, we've got a first of a couple of questions for you actually. Oh, so um, right. yep, before okay, we forget, so we've got first one from YouTube and Matmo. Um, is it true that a World War One tank was used at Arishmal Gap, just down the road, um, as anti-tank invasion gunnery? I don't know about the First World War One. We do know our first World War collection was dragged out around Bovington. So there are pictures of them. The dead tanks were actually put at certain road junctions as basically static pillboxes as potential. Down at Arishmel, there's a photograph of a Vickers Medium. We yeah. saw that just driving around on one of our displays. There's a photograph of one of those actually activated down there in the, um, between the, almost the tank traps. There it is in the, in the center position there. There was a First World War tank on loan. Well, actually it wasn't on loan. It was what they called a memorial tank. It was in Portsmouth Dockyard uh, at the place Whale Island, the gunnery school. They actually got that working in World War II and it patrolled, it drove around uh, the dockyard as again, anti-invasion measure. Apparently, well, luckily for the tank and probably Britain as a whole, we weren't invaded. So um, it, the only actual action it got, apparently one evening, it got slightly lost and it drove over a doctor's car that parked his car in the wrong place. So that was the end of the doctor's car. But. Um, I, I, I know that there's lots of different stories about, you know, because again, in the summer of 1940, the desperation, we've got some of the vehicles here, um, of trying to put an armoured vehicle together quickly because, quite frankly, anything was going to be better than nothing. Um, so half the collection here goes out and starts ending up trying to defend Bovington. Just perhaps clear for everybody, it's down at Lulworth, Arishmole Gap down there, so it's where the ranges are. So we yeah. actually, you know, we take the tanks down there and we fire out to sea, which is always quite amusing. She's always worried that in case you get the wrong scale on your graphical pattern in a tank, it might, you know, fire a hesh round off to the coast of Calais or something. Um, another question for you here uh, from Facebook this time, David, from Milin Junkovic. I do apologise if that's not right. Um, what caused the damage to the front of Little Willie? Good question. Um, as I mentioned, so Little Willie doesn't see any action. It's used as a, first of all, that sort of kind of like test bed. Second type of track is the type that they use on all the British tanks in World War I. Um, so that was really successful, designed by Walter Wilson. Um, that vehicle then kicks around the place for a while. I believe that they probably ended up using, at some point, the engine's missing from it, so it's probably taken out. You can see it in fairly early photographs. At one point it's up in, it's not just at Foster's, it's... Uh, back there in another spot on uh, Upper Arishmel Gap um, and, the, uh, not Arishmel Gap, sorry, it's, a, it's a, uh, one of the training areas just outside London. There's still photographs of it there, but I think what's happened is at some point when it's been either here or down at Bovington, um, it used to be outside, like most of the original part of the collection, someone's put something like a metal hawser through that front piece and dragged it to get it to the position they want, and that has quietly peeled off what was just mild steel. It's not armour plate on the vehicle, so it's just peeled it back. So that's that damage. And like a lot of vehicles here, their history is quite checkered. This idea, we try and keep them in the dry, we look after them as best we can now. In the past, these have been sat outside. Oiks like yourself were playing on them, obviously, when they're out the back here. Um, you know, so it was, uh, well, I remember the first my visit here, I got told off. I remember climbing in the belly plate of, under the hatch to a Sherman, getting covered in oil. So all those things, things have changed, obviously, over time. But uh, that's the damage there. Certainly isn't battle damage. In these difficult times, obviously, your support is really valued. So please do keep following us on social media, do subscribe to our channel. And, and if you've got the opportunity, perhaps order something from our shop, uh, join one of our schemes like Patreon or our friends organization, and we'll try and keep going with giving you some content to keep you informed and entertained.